Hey everyone, and welcome to our April National Sewing Circle Live event. We once again have Nikki LaFoyle back with us, so thank you for being here, Nikki. Glad to be here. All right, but we have some changes that we've made to our program, and we want to kind of start with that, and that is that we're doing a project each month. And so we posted on social media asking for suggestions for three to four random sewing supplies, and the suggestions that we randomly selected were felt, buttons, and hooks. And so we've each made a project from that. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the supplies we use, sort of how we put it together. Um, and then if you have any questions at all, of course, we can answer those, whether they're related to the sewing project or not. So Nikki, what did you make? OK, so I made this little folded up thing. So it's got the hook, which the hook in the eye is how I took the, the hook supply. Um, so I've got my hook and eye there, and when I open it up, this is, it folds out, and I've got all my shapes here, which are attached by the buttons. So you've got the buttons on the back of the shape, and on my buttonhole on my felt piece, I have drawn the shape. So it's a kid's toy for matching shapes and for practicing um, small uh, motor function skills. Um, so ages like two to four, my daughter just turned four and I tested it out on her and she loved it. So that was a win. Um, and it, this is a great scrap buster project. Um, I had a bunch of scraps of felt uh, in my stash. Um, and so as you may be able to tell by the mismatched kind of look of it, ideally all of these pieces would be the same color. The flaps would be the same color as the body, but alas, I did not have that much felt of the same color. And um, I wanted these flaps to be rectangular, but this was the largest um, piece of felt that I had aside from this one. So it became this shape, which it looks kind of like wings, which is kind of cool anyway. So there's a lot of room for um, interpretation. Uh, if you want to make something like this, you can make your flaps rectangular. You can make it whatever size you want. Um, and I started with this white piece is um, like eight by 11, it's a full sheet. You know, they sell these sheets of felt um, at the craft store. So whatever size they sell, uh, it's roughly eight by 11, I believe. Um, so that is the size of my largest piece. And I wanted it to fold up into something that was sort of mobile. So like you can take it in the car with you. Um, so I folded that, sh that white piece into thirds. Uh, with enough overlap, about half inch to three quarters of an inch overlap there, to have the hook in the eye. And then whatever size that fold ends up being, it's, I don't, I didn't even measure it, I just folded it, so it's like four inches or something. Um, that is the size that I cut the edge of my flap. And um, so I just laid my flap onto my white piece and stitched using a, a thread that matched my flap so it would blend in. I actually used a thread that matched my flap in the needle and then on the back side in the bobbin I used a thread that matched the lower layer of felt so that it, it all kind of blended in. And um, I sewed using an all-purpose needle, an all-purpose thread, um, and I did the same thing on the other side for the other flap. And the thing that took the most time, which was not a very time consuming project um, and not, it didn't consume much brain power either. It's, it was a lot of repetitive things. So the thing that took the most time was doing the buttonholes. So um, I have eight buttonholes for my eight shapes. Um, and all of my buttons are different sizes. So um, I just chose my eight largest buttons. So for small fingers, you don't want anything too small. A larger button would be better for, you know, kids just learning how to slip a button through a buttonhole. Um, so my buttons are between seven eighths of an inch in diameter and one and three eighths of an inch. So that was my, my big one, my biggest one right there. And um, to plan out the buttonholes, I wanted to have two rows here. So I just divided this in half to have my buttonholes centered on each half. So I divided that in half and then I 
divide it into quarters to find the, the center point of the buttonhole on this side. And then I marked my buttonholes centered on that line. And each was different, uh, different um, lengths because the buttons are different in diameter. But uh, my buttonhole foot made it a lot easier. So if your machine comes with a buttonhole foot, it's really awesome. Um, it makes sewing buttonholes a lot easier, um, a little more automated. Um, but they only go up to a certain size. So a couple of my buttons I could not use my buttonhole foot with because they were too big. So the buttonhole foot, I don't have my machine with me because I'm not at home right now or else I would show you. Um, but uh, my FAF Passport 2.0 has this buttonhole foot, um, comes, you know, comes with it. Uh, a lot of machines have this as a standard accessory. Um, and so it attaches on the front section of it. So this long part goes to the back. Um, it attaches to the presser foot right here. And you insert your button on the back and cinch that down tight to hold the button in and it kind of measures your button for you so it'll automatically measure how big your buttonhole should be. Um, so choose an, uh, one of your built-in buttonhole stitches and there's going to be a little gray, well mine is gray, there's going to be a little pull down tab somewhere to the left and behind your needle. You want to pull that down so that it sits behind this first little knob and what will happen is when you stitch your buttonhole It'll stitch and the foot moves forward. It'll hit this back one and her answer that tells with by the pressure of that little flag um, that that is where you need to stop and then it'll bounce back and stitch the other side of the buttonhole. So it kind of measures it for you so it cuts out a step. Um, so that is super handy. I would recommend stitching a buttonhole on some scrap fabric first so that you know um, where your buttonhole stitch will begin. So mine starts with the, the bar tack closest to me and then it stitches the left side leg and stitches the far bar tack and then comes back down. I don't know if all machines do the same thing, but I always recommend testing it first anyway. Um, so Stitch as many of your buttonholes as you can. Um, if you have some larger buttons that won't fit in your buttonhole foot, um, you can just marking out your, so you measure your button. So my button, my enormous button was an inch and three eighths in diameter. So you wanna add about an eighth of an inch to that. So my buttonhole wound up being uh, an inch and a half long. So I just marked that centered on my, my uh, center line. And you can stitch your own buttonholes using your zigzag stitch. So again, this is something that you want to practice beforehand to figure out how wide your zigzag stitch should be and how um, close the stitches need to be together. So the um, the um, you want it to be almost like a satin stitch, your zigzag stitch. You want it to be really close together so that it'll create that nice, um, tight, tightly bound like um, for your for the legs of your butt. Um, and you don't want the zigzag stitch to be too wide either because you know you don't want your buttonhole the stitches to be super wide. Um, so mess around with that, and then on the bar tack, um, the the distance your stitch travels, you want to bump that down to pretty much zero because you want that bar tack to just basically be a zigzag stitch that encompasses both um, both of your your buttonhole legs. So the bar tack is that little one that stitches across, and then these are the buttonhole legs. Kind of hard to see. There we go. And um, I did my um, my buttonhole, my thread. I tried to match my thread to my felt, but you don't have to. Um, like I said, there's a lot of room for uh, customizing this. You could use a contrasting thread, whatever you want. Or you could use a thread that matches 
your little felt pieces that you cut out. Um, and then to attach the buttons to your shapes, um, I you can you do by hand, uh, hand sewing needle and thread, um, or you can do it on the machine, but you would have to disengage your feed dogs. So you can consult your machine manual and see how to do this. Um, on my FOF, um, I have to take um, the, the, um, the little section that slides off, whatever, there's a name for it. There's that, that little section that slides off so that you can sew you know, small things in the round. Um, take that section off and then on the back side, there's a little, um, a little switch to, to, to uh, lower the feed dog so that uh, it's not grabbing the fabric and trying to move it. So you can stitch without your fabric moving. So that's what you wanna do when you're stitching um, a button on. Get your zigzag stitch. Um, if you, some machines come with a button foot, which is just like a small rectangular foot with um, two, uh, like two toes that are kind of open in the middle so that they just kind of hold the button down and have this open part in the middle for your zigzag stitch to go across. Um, I just did, I didn't use a foot at all. I just took my foot off and um, and uh, lowered my, my uh, I didn't use a presser foot, but I lowered it down to, um, to kind of hold the button down. And I, I used my hand wheel at first to make sure I had my zigzag stitch to the correct width. Um, because the worst thing you can do is jam on your your presser foot and have that needle fly down and start flying across and your zigzag stitch is too wide for your button and your needle hits your button and it it breaks and the needle flies off somewhere. So use the hand wheel, crank the hand wheel really slowly to make sure your zigzag stitch is the correct width for your button. Um, and take four or five stitches. Um, across the buttonholes and then spin it do it again on the bottom um and i like to leave long thread tails and tie off my threads when i'm doing buttons it just it makes me feel better about my buttons to make sure that they're really on tightly and then i also used some fray check and put a dab on the front and the back to make sure it was really glued on tight because my daughter's going to be playing with this and um, she is not what I would say gentle on her toys. She's four years old. Um, so some fray check um, on the front and back on the threads is a good idea to just really lock it in tight. Um, so you can do whatever shapes you want, obviously. I tried to do some uh, basic shapes for a child's shape recognition. So I've got you know, the square diamond, triangle star, an oval, a tree, because I was running out of ideas for shapes. Um, and then I used, I happen to have some fabric markers around, but you could use permanent markers, um, just probably not washable markers, because if a kid's hands are wet, it would probably rub off. Um, but I also, I tried to match the, the color as I drew my shape over my buttonhole, tried to match the marker color to the felt color. So I happened to have my fabric markers around, so I did my red for the red heart to match that shape, and um, the tan for the star and the moon to match the tan felt. Um, and I should mention too, when you're opening up these buttonholes, so this is a little bit different. Um, when you stitch a buttonhole on regular cotton fabric, usually you're interfacing it um, to, to help keep the buttonhole nice and strong and sturdy because it's a, it's a pressure point. You're putting a button through this buttonhole in and out and it's gonna stretch and pull. So you want the fabric to not stretch out so you'll be interfacing it. I did not interface these buttonholes because um, the front and the back are both visible, so I didn't want just a patch of interfacing to be hanging out there. Um, so I didn't interface it, which is fine. 
um, it'll, I think it'll hold up just fine for, you know, as much as my daughter wants to use it. But when you're opening up these buttonholes, I always use my seam ripper to open up buttonholes. Um, but since I did not interface this felt and felt has some give to it, usually I would take my seam ripper and put it, you know, somewhere in between the, the legs of the buttonhole and just, you know, rip that buttonhole open. But I did that with the first one actually on here and it stretched my felt out quite a lot. So be really careful when you're opening up the buttonholes. If you want to use your seam ripper, first of all, this is a tip for any buttonhole, put a pin in the bar tack at each end so that when you put your seam ripper in and pull it to one side, you don't accidentally pull it all the way through the bar tack. Um, the pin will stop it before it gets there. Um, so if you're using your seam ripper, just hang on to um, hang on really close to the seam ripper and don't, you know, don't really pull at it and yank at it. Um, just go really carefully and gently so you don't stretch out the felt. Or if you have some really sharp pointed scissors, um, that's also great to just kind of snip in there and get up to the end, uh, the end of the buttonhole. Um, so, and cut your shapes um, as big as you can. Again, we're working with uh, a two to a four year old, small hands, so we don't want, um, well, they're, you know, they have small hands, but they're also not very coordinated. Um, so you want big things for them so that they're, they're not frustrated working with these tiny little buttons and tiny little shapes. So big shapes if you can, um, depending on how big, oops, uh, depending on how big your, you know, your side flap is and how big your main body is. If you do something a little bigger, you can obviously have bigger shapes. Um, but I just did my shapes as big as would fit in its own little section without overlapping and so that you know the shapes would fit on the flaps so that everything could fold up um and be a, a little kind of like a little carry along carry along toy um i actually i brought this with me from michigan <clears throat> i'm in colorado right now so we did the drive in a couple of days. So we all spent a couple of days in the car together. And I brought this with me um, for this purpose. And my daughter played with it in the car. And it worked just as wonderfully as I hoped it would. Um, so the last step of this would be the hook and the eye. So there are several different kinds of hooks and eyes. Um, I did the biggest kind I could for the same reason as I was just talking about. So there there's this kind of hook which is this big flat um kind of hook there are also there's also the small like more traditional hook hook um which i thought would be a little bit difficult for my daughter to get her little hands on so i did the big kind and the eye is the the flat kind of bar kind of eye so i sewed those on just with my hand sewing needle and thread um there are there are holes on uh, each side of the hook and then on the bottom. So I just, you know, threw a couple stitches in each of those and tied it off. Um, and I also want to mention that I used all flat buttons for this. So um, there are different types of buttons. So there's the flat buttons that either have two or four holes, typically. Um, and then there's the shank button, which I didn't bring any shank buttons with me, but um, they have uh, a little um, kind of loop on the back side, and that is how you attach that button to wherever you're attaching it to. You sew through that little loop on the back, um, and it makes the button stick up a little bit more um, than the flat buttons, which lie really nicely to whatever you're sewing. Um, you could definitely use shank buttons for this project. Um, but I don't know if there is a way to sew a shank button on, uh, on by machine. I think you would have to do it all by hand. Um, I have to look into that to see if there's a way to do it by machine. You may be able to fold the fabric and have the shank button on one side and do a zigzag stitch, but um, I'm not sure that would work 
because then the button would stick up under the presser foot. There might not be a way to do it by machine. So it'd be a little more time consuming to do with a shank button because you'd have to do it um, with a hand sewing needle and thread. Um, but it would definitely be doable um, to have that shank button on the back and still use it in the same way and slide it through your felt. Um, so that uh, is my project. It is pretty straightforward. It, is, it was really fun to do. And thank you all for your suggestions on different supplies. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was kind of a, a fun little uh, little project to dive into my stash and brainstorm what to make from those, those three supplies. Um, and if anybody has any other ideas on what to do with felt and buttons and hooks, um, that would be fun to share either on uh, the National Sewing Circle Facebook page um, or uh, in the comment section on this page. Um, and it looks like uh, Ashley is having some technical issues. So that's why she hasn't popped in and it's just been me talking at you for the last 20 minutes. Um, but she's trying to, um, She's trying to get back on, so we'll see if we can get Ashley back on. Otherwise, um, if not, send your questions to me, and I can field them to myself. We will definitely miss Ashley and um, her her beautiful face and all of her insights that she has into sewing questions. Um, so we have a question here, actually, uh, from Lois, who asks, trying to hem a prom dress with layers. Painful. Any tips? Um, so a prom dress that has um, different layers, I guess it would depend on um, the type of material that it is. So if a prom dress, if it's different layers of satin, um, it might just be, you know, I don't know if there's anything I could say to make that go any faster. Um, you know, you've just got to... to um, your, your iron is your friend. Um, definitely, um, definitely use your iron to, uh, to help yourself along uh, low setting, iron from the back, test a little bit first um, so you don't, you know, burn your fabric or scorch it to create any, and create any shiny spots. So test first, but um, ironing a hem flat really flat and crisp first before you sew it is it um it helps create a really nice professional uh professionally and crisp looking hem um and i would say also test um a little bit uh in an inconspicuous area first um to make sure you got all of your settings right um, so if you're stitching um, prom dresses, a lot of times are satin. So I'm trying to think of satin tips. Um, using a finer needle a lot of times helps with satin because um, satin can snag pretty easily. And also, uh, if you're using a needle that is too big or a needle that is dull, um, your the holes in your seam, the holes that your needle creates can um, be just a little bit too big and that that satin fabric won't uh, be as forgiving if you create too big of a, too big of a hole and your seam will get um, it'll first of all it'll be weaker and you'll get some grin through um, so uh, a, a thinner needle either an all-purpose needle in a finer size or even a microtex needle can a lot of times help you um, have a nice uh, even tension and a nice, beautiful looking seam. Um, an all purpose thread will probably be fine for that, um, but a, uh, a rayon thread might actually be even better because rayon thread uh, has a little shine to it um, on its own, so it might match the satin fabric better. Um, a lot of all purpose thread. Uh, is a little more matte, not as matte as 100% cotton thread, which is uh, very dull and matte, um, but rayon thread is just especially shiny. So um, it's good for use with a lot of special occasion fabrics because of the shine and also 
um, because it's a little finer than all-purpose thread. Or you can find an all-purpose thread that is marked fine. They do make thread um, just that is called fine thread, and it's just a little bit thinner, uh, which is good for a lot of thin fabrics. Um, and if you find that um, you're getting a lot of slippage, so this is a satin tip that is more of a general satin tip because if you're doing a hem, um, you're not going to have um, the, the right side of the satin to the right side of the satin, but um, still you're gonna be folding the satin and trying to stitch it. So um, you may get a little bit of slippage there. Um, layers of tissue paper. I'm so sad that Ashley's not here to tease me about my tissue paper tip. Um, tissue paper between layers of satin can help minimize slippage um, because when you've got a layer of sheer uh, like shiny slippery satin against a layer of shiny slippery satin it gets a lot of slippage so putting a layer of tissue paper in between just cuts down on you know the surface area of that satin that's touching um, and that can decrease slippage and also help your seam uh, to help stabilize your seam so if you're using a really fine fabric um, it'll help stabilize the fabric and the seam and um, give your sewing machine something to grab onto. So if you're using a really thin fabric, a lot of times you'll have tension issues or, you know, your fabric is going to get jammed down into the, the, into the throat plate um, because your fabric is so thin. Tissue paper just helps to stabilize that. So um, if you have any more specific questions on that, be sure to send them in. Um, but those are my my general tips for that. Um, so let's see, we have some more questions coming in. Um, could I put stabilizer between, Peggy asks, could I put stabilizer between two pieces of felt to make the felt less stretchy? Absolutely. Um, and that is goes along the lines of what I was just talking about with putting, um, putting tissue paper between layers of, uh, layers of satin um, to give the, you know, give the the seam something to really hold on to. So stabilizer is exactly for that purpose, to keep fabrics from stretching. Um, and a lot of times people use stabilizer interchangeably. I'll touch make sure there's no confusion. Um, interfacing a lot of times is used um, in sewing for stabilizing behind buttonholes, behind the zipper area. It's used to stiffen collars and cuffs to give body and stiffness to, um, to a garment where it is desired. <coughs> um, stabilizer, um, typically the term stabilizer is used uh, in, in a machine embroidery aspect where you hoop a piece of stabilizer and then um, either hoop a piece of fabric or lay the fabric over the hooped stabilizer um, to support the fabric under um, uh, under all of the threads of the design that's being laid down. Um, but in this case, um, so interfacing a lot of times is meant to stay in the garment and <clears throat> stay within the layers of the fabric. Um, and that's not always true for stabilizer uh, in machine embroidery. A lot of times, most of the stabilizer is torn away. So it would depend upon <clears throat> depend on um, what project you're doing. If you want to use some sort of stabilizer or um, interfacing, um, but uh, actually, a tear away stabilizer. So machine embroidery stabilizer comes in a lot of different varieties, uh, water soluble, heat removable, cut away and tear away. So if you're looking to put some stabilizer between two pieces of felt to make it less stretchy, <clears throat> if in that instance you then after the fact wanted to tear the stabilizer away so that the stabilizer would not remain within the project, you could use tear away stabilizer. You could use tissue paper or a couple of layers of tissue paper. Um, or if, uh, for whatever reason, if it was, 
within the project and you wouldn't see the stabilizer, then you could even leave the stabilizer in it or use interfacing and leave it in there. Um, so, um, yeah, I hope that answered the question, Peggy, um, without knowing, you know, exactly what the project is. Uh, my answer would be yes, you can put stabilizer between two pieces of felt to make it less stretchy. Um, so let me see. It's it's hard for me to read the questions um, ahead of time and uh, figure them out while I'm answering a question. So uh, let's look at what other questions we have. Aurora asks, when it comes to doing alterations on dresses you get at thrift stores, do you need to separate the skirt portion from the top if you are resizing the top? Does the skirt material need to be changed in any way? Um, so this is a thing that I love to do, getting uh, clothes from thrift stores and then just altering them. Uh, thrifting clothes is uh, a, a pastime of mine. Uh, you can find some really great treasures. And even if the treasures are not in your size, when you know how to sew, that does not, you know, that's not a barrier anymore. You can um, get whatever you want and resize it to fit yourself. So if you like the fabric of something or the cut of something, grab it and you can alter it to fit you. So in this instance, um, if you want to resize the top, but the skirt fits fine, um, I would say unless you are resizing where the skirt meets the top, you don't have to do anything to the skirt. Um, and you don't even have to, you know, take the skirt off of the top. It would only be if you are doing something that affects, um, that affects the skirt. So if you were, you know, taking in a dart, like a princess dart that went into the skirt, then you would have to, um, then you would have to, you know, do this, um, uh, you know, alter that dart that goes into the skirt. Or if you're um, taking in the side seams, if it affects the seam where uh, the bodice seam that, if it affects the bodice seam that attaches to the skirt, um, you would have to, so if you t took in the bodice, you would have to take in the skirt that much so that the seam, the bodice seam, would match the skirt scene where those you, you know where they join so um, whatever you um, you know those seams would just have to match is all but if you were doing you know just an arm's eye or a neckline or or something even down to uh, down the side seam a little bit but not into the skirt you wouldn't have to touch the skirt at all it's only if um, if it affects that seam where the bodice attaches to the skirt. So let me see what else we have. Um, Sarah asks, I don't like that aprons will protect clothing from solids, but not liquids. So I was brainstorming ways to protect from splashing. Fabric stores have vinyl tablecloth material on big spools, though it wouldn't take much for what I have in mind. Basically have the outer pretty layer, then on the side facing you, use the vinyl material. Have you ever done something like this? And if so, do you have any suggestions on how to best work with these materials? Um, I have not done anything like that. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, because that's absolutely true. An apron will protect you from getting globs of stuff on you, but then that, if it's wet, it soaks right through and gets on your clothes anyway. So, um, yeah, I've not done something like that, but, um, yeah, you could have a, a cotton layer on the outside and then line it with something waterproof, and fabric stores have, um, some different options for waterproof fabrics. So there's um, there's that vinyl fabric um, that you may find in more like the home deck area of the fabric store. There's also oil cloth, which um, oil cloth they make in a lot of fun fabrics as well. Um, that's the 
it's like a, a cotton fabric, but it's um, it's coated in something to make it waterproof. You could even just maybe do one layer of that for the for the whole apron. Um, and the wrong side of that is a lot of times a nice soft, like flannel-y kind of, um, kind of feeling material. Um, so you'd have that, that waterproof on the outside <clears throat> um, without having to do two layers possibly. Um, or even, um, I know it wouldn't take much, it doesn't take much material to do a, um, an apron. So you could have, um, if you had like an old raincoat or thrift a raincoat and use that material on the wrong side to make your apron waterproof or um, look for um, vinyl tablecloths or shower curtains even, um, you know, at garage sales or, or thrift stores and just use that, um, cut out your pieces for the wrong side um, out of that. Um, so in terms of sewing something like that, when you're sewing vinyl or even oil cloth, um, <clears throat> um, it takes a little bit, um, you have to be a little bit more precise simply because once you sew a line of stitching in vinyl, there's no, you know, unpicking that and taking it out and trying again. Because once you put a hole in vinyl, that hole is going to be there. Vinyl is not like a traditional fabric that's um, threads woven together where, um, you know, if you unpick a seam, it'll kind of, you know, the threads will kind of forgive you that hole. Um, vinyl is basically plastic. So once you pop a hole in it, that hole is going to stay there. So, um, yeah, there's no unpicking it and sewing, a, sewing it again because the more you, you know, try to sew over it, um, you're just going to be creating more holes and then it's going to be a perforation in the fabric and then it's just going to be nothing. Um, so just be precise. Use a longer stitch length for the same reason. If you have um, a short stitch length and it's a whole bunch of holes right next to each other, it becomes a perforation. So use a longer stitch length to preserve that seam line and help keep that seam line strong. Um, an all-purpose needle is fine for sewing vinyl. All-purpose thread is fine as well. Um, sewing things like vinyl, and actually, coming back to this just for a quick second, um, sewing felt will also dull your needle quick. So sewing vinyl is another thing that will dull your needle pretty quickly. So um, on this, I had a whole bunch of buttonholes, which is a whole bunch of stitches, um, you know, a whole bunch of... Of, of stitches a whole bunch of times that needle has been going through my felt so after this fabric after this project even though it was not big and it wasn't really a lot of stitching and a lot, it certainly wasn't six hours on my needle um i tossed the needle anyway because when you're sewing on felt it dulls your needle quicker same thing for when you're sewing vinyl it'll dull your needle quicker um and you know, if you're sewing faux leather, if you're sewing uh, insole bright, that that batting that's got the flex of silver in it, that uh, insulated material, that'll dull your needle quicker. Fleece will dull your needle pretty quick. Um, so anything like that, if you're sewing, um, just keep an eye on it. You may have to change that needle uh, a little sooner than the the standard. You know, when they say four to six hours of sewing time on a needle, it may be. A little less than that if you're sewing a lot of those materials um so and um just real quick um i know i'm going off on a in a different direction here uh, without ashley to keep me on track i'm just gonna you know keep going and keep going in uh whatever direction my my jabber takes me um but how to tell if your needle is getting dull if you're sewing a lot of felt or sewing a lot of vinyl and um, you start having tension issues. First thing I do is change my needle. And a lot of times that will clear up the tension problems. So just having that dull, having a dull needle, it, um, it makes it harder for the needle to penetrate through the fabric and harder for it to make that connection with the bobbin thread that it's winding around um, and all kinds of tension problems um, come from that. So, um, 
if, if you're having tension problems, maybe a dull needle. If you hear your fabric kind of, or if you see it jumping when the needle goes through it, or if you hear the needle making a thunk, thunk, thunk sound as it's piercing the fabric, signs of a dull needle. And that, uh, that movement that your fabric makes against the bed of your machine um, is called flagging. So when you get flagging, that fabric kind of jumping when your needle goes through it, it's a sign of a dull needle. Um, so what was I talking about? <laughs> went on my tangent, the apron. Um, so those are my tips for sewing with vinyl. If you're going to be sewing a vinyl lining um, on the inside of your apron to make it waterproof, which I think is a fantastic idea. Sarah, thank you for that question. Um, let's see. Um, what other questions we have gotten here? Um, does Microtex Brenda asks, does Microtex also work for stretch fabrics? Um, so I'm guessing that that refers to when I was talking about the Microtex needle. Um, and in that case, I would say no, simply because stretch fabrics, when you're sewing on stretch fabrics, you want to use um, a ballpoint needle. Um, so a uh, Microtex needle an all-purpose needle and denim needles and all these other kinds of needles, um, they have a really sharp tip. And the Microtex needles needle, most of all, has that really, really sharp, fine point. Um, and when you're sewing stretch fabrics um, or knit fabrics, um, which also a lot of times have the stretch fibers like spandex knitted into them, uh, you know, woven into the, the threads and then the threads are knitted, um, so if you have a really sharp needle, a lot of times that as that goes through the fabric, it will um, cut some of the threads, just, you know, the nature of the thing. And with knit fabrics, especially fine stretch fabrics like spandex, that can create a run in your knit. Um, so you'll want to use a ballpoint needle or a stretch needle or a jersey needle. So there's three types of needles that are appropriate for knit fabrics. And they all are basically the same. They have the same, you know, the same needle construction. So the ballpoint, the jersey, or the stretch needle. And instead of a really sharp tip at the end of the needle, the tip is just slightly rounded. It's still very sharp. You're still gonna make yourself bleed if you poke yourself with it. Um, but it's not quite so sharp. And instead of cutting through the fibers as the needle passes through the fabric, it sort of nestles in between um, the knit, the, you know, the looped together threads of that knit constructed fabric. Um, so it'll prevent runs. It'll help keep your seam strong, help keep your fabric strong through a lot of washing and wearing. Um, so that is what, that is what I always recommend, um, for knit fabrics. Um, and while we're talking about knit fabrics, um, Another tip for working with knit fabrics, in addition to the needle type, is use an all-purpose thread. So don't use a 100% cotton thread when you're sewing with a knit fabric, um, because the cotton thread does not have um, any give to it. Uh, does not have any stretch at all. Um, all-purpose thread is a cotton-wrapped polyester core thread. So that polyester core has a little bit of stretch to it. Um, so as that knit fabric is stretching and moving, your thread will have at least a little bit of give with it. And of course, whenever you're sewing knit fabrics, if you're sewing a seam that needs to stretch, um, such as, you know, the neckline seam or um, even the hem, if you're going to you know be pulling it over your head and stretching that seam, you want to make sure you use a stretch stitch which would be your zigzag stitch or your triple stretch stitch. Um, or uh, my, my Passport 2.0 actually has a, a special um, zit, like three-step zigzag stitch. So it's a zigzag, like an extra zig and a zag in the zigzag. So it's for really stretchy fabrics um, to give that seam a lot of stretch. Um, so, 
And when working with knit fabrics, I'm going to go down my list of knit tips because this is, a, this is something that comes up a lot too, um, tips for sewing with knits since knit garments are so, um, so, you know, in style and, you know, works with our, you know, everyday lives. Uh, they're very comfortable to wear, so people want to sew them a lot. Um, a lot of times the knit fabrics that you're sewing are pretty uh, malleable and kind of slinky almost. This is especially true for spandex fabrics. Um, if you're sewing, uh, you've got your two layers together. If you get slippage, which a lot of times will happen with knit fabrics, um, there are several things that you can do so that your seam will stay together and you won't get um, one layer of knit stretching out or slipping um, so that your fabric will stay even on both sides of the seam. Um, you can use a walking foot. So the walking foot is basically like having a set of feed dogs on the bottom of your presser foot. So the feed dogs feed the fabric, um, the fabric layer that's laying against the bed of your machine. They feed the fabric through. And a lot of times um, the top layer of fabric will not go at the same rate because it kind of slips. So if you have another set of feed dogs on the top, it'll feed your fabric through at the same rate. So the walking foot will do that. A roller foot will do that. Um, my FOF Passport 2.0 has the integrated dual feed foot, which works as a walking foot. It's a little black thing that I pull down on the back of my foot, on the back of the presser foot that works as a walking foot. And I usually always have that engaged unless I'm sewing like a zipper or if I have to put my buttonhole foot on or something. Um, but that works as well. Um, and that is actually also, I was talking about sewing satin earlier. Um, if you get slippage with satin, you can try to use one of those presser feet as well. Um, um, and tissue paper in between the layers. Again, I'm going to throw that in, um, which helps uh, with a lot of things, stabilizing the seam, preventing slippage, and preventing your fabric from being pushed down into the throat plate, which is an issue with uh, lightweight fabrics, like I was talking about earlier with the satin, but also the really slinky, stretchy, malleable fabrics like a spandex um, that may get pushed down into the throat plate. Um, if that is a big issue, your fabric getting pushed down into the throat plate, you can also try a single stitch throat plate. Uh, but the issue there is um, you can only use a straight stitch with it. You can't use a zigzag stitch because the straight stitch throat plate has just that tiny little opening in it um, that only allows the needle to go down in the that one position it can't go you know zigzag um, but since it has just that one small hole the fabric does not get pushed down into the throat plate um, at all so um, that is something that's out there that you can use if that is, um, has been an issue um, if you have any more uh, questions about sewing knit fabrics send them in but that's my my general list of, of knit um, sewing tips um so let me see what other questions we have got here um india asked what are common issues you face when sizing up a pattern um so when sizing up a pattern, so say you've got your pattern and um, you need to increase a size somewhere, or um, if you've got a pattern that um, you know you cut out years ago, or you got a second hand or something, and it's cut out, but you need the next size up, and that size has already been cut away. So if you want to grade the entire pattern up a size, um, you can do that, or if you only need to increase the size in some areas, um, you can do that as well, but you'll want to, um, stitch a muslin fitting sample first. So using fabric that is similar to the fabric that you're going to be stitching the final project in, um, 
so usually just a nice uh, firmly woven cotton. Um, uh, cut out your pieces and sew it um, using a basting stitch uh, as you would sew the project. Um, and you can use that as a starting point. Put that on and see where your fitting issues are. Um, if you know that you're going to need a whole bigger size, you can probably skip this step and make some changes to the pattern first. Um, but if you only need to increase the size in some areas and not in others, this is a good place to start to see where you need um, to change the pattern. Um, so with your muslin fitting sample, it's really easy to put it on yourself, see where you need changes, um, pin, you know, right on it, and then transfer those uh, markings onto the pattern. So you'll wanna get uh, a big sheet of paper to lay the pattern on and trace it off. Um, I usually trace a copy of the pattern as it is and then make my changes um, to that uh, to that paper that I had traced off on, um, just in case I ever need to go back, in case I screw up my, my paper really bad and need to go back to the original, which is not, you know, is not uh, too uncommon. Um, preserve that original by tracing off a copy before you start making, you know, cutting it up and making marks to it. Um, but common issues when sizing patterns, a lot of times I get questions, um, someone is in between sizes or you're a 10 here and an eight here. So how do you navigate that? Um, so you can, you can grade in between sizes. Um, you know, the, the pattern lines on a commercial pattern, you know, the size eight and the size 10 as the measurements are might fit like one person in 10,000. So, you're going to have to make some changes if you want that to fit your body exactly. Um, so to grade between sizes, um, it's really actually pretty easy. I have a French curve ruler that I use all the time when I'm um, uh, when I'm doing pattern alterations. It's it's a long ruler. It's got you know a curve on one end so that you can match the grade of the curve to any arm's eye or you know hip seam uh, hip curve that you're doing. Um, so to grade between sizes, if you want to go from, uh, say, you know, the underarm and go between a size down to your waistline, it's just as easy as that. Take a, a pencil first. Don't take a marker or a pen because you want to be able to, you know, make changes if you need to. Um, so using a pencil, just, um, start at your your size 10 or whatever it may be and just gently following the curve as much as you can um, go trace down and in between the lines ending up at your size eight or whatever the case may be down at the waistline or whatever point you're grading into um, and that you can do that with any curve if you're going between sizes along your arm's eye just you know, draw that curve outward a little bit, um, keeping with the curve as much as you can. Um, and when you are making any changes to a seam line, you wanna make sure that then that seam line is still going to match whatever other pattern piece is going to be connected to that seam line. Um, so if you, uh, make a drastic change to your arm size seam line. You want to make sure you uh, the um, the sleeve cap is still going to fit into that. So you can do that by um, either walking the pattern pieces or um, using a um, a fabric measuring tape on on its side and measure right along the seam line um, and. Anything that you do, um, the last thing I'll say is the anything that you do to um, uh, one side of the seam line, you want to do to the other. So if you are making a change to the, the side seam on the front, um, you want to make sure that that is still going to fit the, the seam on the back. So either make the very same change 
to the back or um, again, measure the seam line and make sure it's still going to fit the seam on the back. Um, so um, we'll answer one more because uh, we're coming to the end here. Uh, Darla asks, I'm trying to sew a big bow, like a fabric hair bow, but large, like mini mouse sized bow onto a tote bag. What is the best way to go about this? Um, so to make a bow, I would, um, you can stitch the bow, uh, most of it on the machine, but then to attach it to the tote bag, I would probably do a, a hand sewing needle and thread to just attach the back of it um, so you don't see the thread on the, on the right side. But to make a bow, um, I would take a rectangle and um, sew the long sides together, uh, the long seam together, right sides together, and turn it inside out. And then fold that, fold the raw edges in to meet at the middle. And then do, do that again, but a smaller size to make something to wrap around the center, um, to cinch in the center of that big rectangle so you have your big bow and then it's cinched in at the center. And use your hand sewing needle um, to, uh, to stitch all the layers together and then to stitch it onto the tote bag, but not going all the way through to the front so you don't see any of the threads on the front. Um, that made sense to me in my brain, hopefully with my, you know, my gesturing that made sense to you as well. Um, so thank you all everyone for your questions. It's very rare that I get to do the, the sign off by myself. So I wanna take the time to say, Thank you very much, everyone, for sending in your questions and for watching. Hopefully, I answer your sewing questions um, um, efficiently enough. And uh, we'll be back next month for another live event. Um, hopefully, I will see many of you again. If I didn't get to your questions, um, try me again next month. And um, Ashley will be posting on the Facebook page, um, I believe, um, asking for suggestions for for three random sewing supplies for another um, another uh, creative project for next month. So be sure to submit some ideas for that and follow along and see what we come up with. And if you um, come up with a project too, we would love to hear about what it is. Um, if you do a project with our supply, the, the three supplies that we choose um, as well, uh, let us know on Facebook, the National Sewing Circle Facebook page. You can post your pictures or just post a comment and let us know what you made. We would really love to hear about it. So um, Ashley will be back uh, next month um, with me as well. So you can um, have a little break from just me talking the whole time. Um, we, we love Ashley, she, she's great at uh, answering the sewing questions with me as well. She's not just a host, she's, she's a seamstress as well. So um, thank you again, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Bye.